Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Forward Maryland. My name is Bill Woodcock and I am going solo this evening. Uh, Jason Booms is unfortunately under the weather this evening. Get well soon. Uh, but the show must go on. And uh, with us tonight is to talk about the uh, effects of the coronavirus and the effects of the pandemic on the arts community in Howard County and by association, the state of Maryland, is Nina Basu, the CEO and president of the Inner Arbor Trust. Nina, thank you for joining us this evening. Glad to be here. And, and full disclosure, uh, I am also a, a corporate officer of the Inner Arbor Trust. So uh, yes, a little bit of nepotism at play here, but you know, if we want, we wanted to get someone from the arts community and when you know people, you get people. So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the experience of the trust is, is similar to the experience of all other arts organizations. Uh, but Nina, I'm sure that there are confused people going, did he say Inner Arbor, Inner Harbor? Is this gonna be about the statue? Uh, what is he doing? What is the Inner Arbor Trust? Uh, so, so you could explain what the Inner Arbor Trust is because it is a Howard County based organization. Absolutely. So um, it's a little bit of a play on words. In 2012, when there was the first set of conversations um, with what ended up becoming the Inner Arbor Plan and the uh, overall um, structure for re developing symphony woods and i hate that word developing because we're not putting up high rises or apartment buildings or office buildings instead we are putting up among other things trees um and obviously uh certain buildings and improvements and pathways to make symphony woods usable as a destination arts and culture park so in 2012 uh, our founder um came up with a really easy way to think of the property, which fully surrounds Meriwether Post Pavilion, which at that time was about 36 acres. It's increased in size due to some transfers of land from Howard Hughes to about 51 acres. It was the idea, like the Inner Harbor, here is a piece of land that completely surrounds this thing in the middle that needs to work together that was about the same size as the Inner Harbor. Obviously, the most important feature of Symphony Woods are the trees. It's what makes everything different, not just uh, with Symphony Woods as a public park or the Chrysalis as a community venue, but Meriwether Post Pavilion as a commercial venue is just an incredible experience because it's nestled within this grove of trees. So a lot of his focus was on those trees. So eventually this, this play on words became a plan that the Columbia Association adopted, and from that plan, uh, it became the name of the organization. Uh, it's it's a little bit of a mouthful, um, but it, it is who we are, and you know, um, often we are called either the trust or or, or IAT or or sometimes the chrysalis or sometimes the giant green thing in the middle of Columbia. We'll answer to any of them. So, what does the trust operate? So. The trust holds what's called a perpetual easement over uh, about 51 acres of land, which is put in four phases. We have a, a, we are in control of phase one of that easement, which is about 23 acres. So we own the Chrysalis building and we operate that for the benefit of the community. And then we, uh, with assistance from the Columbia Association, manage about 23 acres of the park in phase one. We're currently in process of installing two uh, large long pathways, which uh, will make the park much more usable to people who wanna go take a walk, um, who wanna go engage with nature and it makes the chrysalis more usable for the community as well. And ironically, that improvement massively benefits uh, the trees and the turf because we can push all use and, and travel in that space across these pathways and not just sort of willy-nilly on the turf. 
so so that was going to be my first question was the was to tell the listeners and viewers how the capital progress is proceeding at the park due to due to the pandemic and you're saying that it's it's a little delayed but it's still on mm -hmm. um track we have two pathways that are being installed they are staked out right now and they're fully engineered and we've got permits for them um uh and so i always say if the permits there were under construction they should be completed by uh mid-september of this year so that will be a really great opportunity for the entire community um their walking paths very similar to uh the ca trails right right so i guess maybe the focus of of what we wanted to educate people on this evening was the effect on just how an arts community or an arts organization operates and you know ours is a very good example being now in its fourth full season of, of running and it's you know it's been growing uh and there's a broad array of uh of of events that have gone on at the park uh and with and using the chrysalis amphitheater so you know what's the what's the you know just again i know this answer but again for the audience what's the current status of the parks of the chrysalises even yeah. i use it interchangeably of the 2020 season and um and what sorts of you know on the fly what sorts of discussions what sorts of things have you had to deal with over these past four months uh with with regard to the schedule it has been a very difficult four months um so for us because we have mostly a public mission uh, a large percentage of our events are free to attend, which means that, that they're fully donor sponsored. And unsurprisingly, a lot of those donations, um, a lot of the sponsorships dried up as soon as COVID hit. Uh, so for us, um, going into this year has been pretty difficult. We were in a really great place. Um, uh, and then COVID hit. So, um, while we are a presenting organization, I think a lot of the brunt of this pandemic has been borne by the artists themselves. So mm -hmm. we have lost out on sponsorships. We've lost out on, you know, some grant money. We've, you know, definitely had to tighten belts there and we've canceled most of our events for this season. But those artists who we were going to pay to perform and who have you know, not just us, but, you know, tons of, of, um, of planned performances uh, all throughout the region. Uh, right now in Maryland, almost all of those have been canceled. Um, there is, you know, one really great thing about Howard County is that the arts community works really well together. The Arts Council has put together a relief fund for artists to deal with some of those direct issues for a presenting organization which is also a venue not only <coughs> do we have to present things you know whether those are concerts or um you know any sort of we've got musicals we've got a, a variety of different types of performances we have to maintain the physical facility uh one of our biggest expenses is insurance um as you can imagine costs a lot to ensure the property. We have to make sure that the power is still running, that fire monitoring is taking place, um, you know, that the space is being maintained. So uh, we've definitely have had some challenges as we've gone through that process. For us, we have both a benefit and a negative. Uh, we have a limited se season because we're outdoors, which is the negative. But the benefit mm -hmm. is we have been able to partially reopen not for performances yet but we have been offering the space for meetings and for um you know people you know it is a public park for people to get together we are looking at being able to offer the chrysalis stage for some events that are you know not performances and therefore you don't have the same gathering keeping people socially distant but letting people actually get together um, in small groups, which has been 
really exciting to work through. We are currently hoping that the governor and the county executive um, are able to uh, make the decision to move to a later phase and that the numbers go down. Um, we are currently planning on opening in September. Um, we have much smaller events. So for those people who look at the orchestra concert and see that giant sea of people and think there are too many people, well, this is the time to come see the Columbia Orchestra. We are planning to hold a, a number, a small number, but a number of um, smaller chrysalis events where we will be able to work with the artists and the county to have social distancing. Um, during this time, I have learned more about the range that um, anything inside an instrument will travel than I ever thought possible. There is a really interesting University of Colorado study about this. I've seen a an early draft um, of their findings and you know um, we're thinking through things in sort of a, a, a logical fashion but we will continue to uh, look to the leadership of the county and the state on reopening and reopening plans and the health department and our local officials have been really easy to work with. So, so you're talking about the air that from mm -hmm. a woodwind or a, or a brass uh, or a brass instrument. Yep. Would, would the, uh, would, would a uh, string quartet be a safer option than it would orchestra? Be. It would indeed. We've also been talking about um, spray patterns, um, which is uh, something I never thought about. Uh, bathrooms are always a concern. I, I know Governor Cuomo got a question about this a few days ago, which I think entertained uh, news agencies everywhere. But, you know, making sure that people can use the facilities in as safe a way as possible. It would also occur to me that, you know, perhaps uh, if there is some sort of regional or perhaps even national triangle festival, I mean, that it may not be too late to, to try to attract that. A triangle festival would probably so be a triangle, you know, soprano, alto triangle. You, you definitely are thinking about the low risk instruments there. Well, I'm trying, I'm trying, but, but, but to get the, on a serious note, um, you mentioned before, and you skipped ahead very beautifully to somewhere where I wanted to go with this, which was individual artists, because I'm imagining that these are the people who are suffering most. I mean, these Absolutely. are proprietors. Um, per, I'm guessing that for the most part, not eligible for unemployment insurance. So, you so, know, it, it during this time, Maryland, and I believe that all states are, are there, but Maryland has absolutely processed unemployment claims for independent contractors. Okay. So there is some small amount of relief, uh, but for a lot of these folks, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the gig economy. Um, most of these artists who are incredibly talented make their money uh, through performances for a number of different genres. The majority of their season is this summer season, especially people who play festivals. Um, you know, we have a number of events in partnership with other community organizations and arts organizations that are um, a little atypical. For example, Fantasy Wood with Manic Art um, uh, in um, the woods, that event was canceled, not only is that a huge blow to the many performing artists that attend and perform at that event, there are a, a lot of vendors, a lot of local businesses that um, make their entire year on the festival circuit, whether those are food service businesses or a lot of craftspeople who primarily sell at a number of these different shows and festivals and other events. Um, so that's a, a really big economic hit for those folks. And as a presenting organization, in a lot of ways, we are able to, to you know, insulate ourselves, um, you know, from those, those pieces because most of those folks were not contracted. So 
while some of these presenting organizations have avoided that cost, we've, you know, watched our partners have a tremendous economic blow. So mm. as I think I said before, Howard County Arts Council has put together a bit of a relief fund. There are a number of COVID relief funds um, that are available. If you go to Marylanders for the Arts, um, their website has a lot of great resources, not only for artists who may be looking for economic relief, but also if you're someone who likes consuming art, if you like to go to these concerts, if you like to buy theater tickets, uh, please consider making sure that those artists are still available in a year to perform. Uh, even a lot of free events are, you know, really important pieces of the ecosystem. While some of our free events are put on by uh, amateur musicians, um, really excellent amateur musicians, you know, the majority of the, the folks who are performing in these amateur, uh, excuse me, in these free events are still professional artists and even if the artists are not directly getting paid, those organizations, those community organizations, um, you know, need that funding. And everyone associated with that performance is currently out of work. The riggers, the lighting people, the sound people. Um, it's, a, it's much more than just the artist, uh, his or herself. Well, yeah, there's a whole support structure Absolutely. who generally, you know, people, of course, don't see unless yeah. unless there's something goes wrong and, and they don't have work. And, and you know, I mean, I, I know that we have both taken advantage of uh, curbside carryout and, mm -hmm. and a nice restaurant delivery. But, you know, what occurs to me is, you know, governor signed that order and lickety split, you know, come restaurants had people redo the website and now we're open for curbside carryout and delivery and you know the artist or the craftsperson or the whoever is selling their stuff who i might stop by um the chrysalis for a show or the festival uh, not the festival the lakefront um celebration of the arts or any other such festival event and pick up their card um, you know, there's, there's, there's not a very easy way for those people to, to have like a similar, you know, route of access. For people Absolutely. I think Columbia Festival of the Arts is a great, uh, example of a wonderful community organization that puts on this amazing two week festival. I think most people in Howard County think first of the lakefront uh, free weekend, uh, which is a wonderful uh, mm -hmm. experience. But in addition to that, they're putting on two full weeks of programs, many of which are ticketed. So not only is the presenting organization um, you know, not able to have their events, there are so many people, so many people who are involved in that event you know, from all of the, the they have most wonderful juried art, artisan, craftsperson, uh, you know, festival where people are selling some really amazing pieces of art. All of those, you know, all of those folks are not able to, to sell. Um, I know some of them are trying to do some things on the internet and I, I don't know how, how effective that is, but mm -hmm. you know, this big event is, is not happening. Um, but also it's two full weeks of, you know, a couple of arts events daily and all of those, you know, not just the artists, but the entire arts ecosystem working um, during that time. They put on a wonderful online film festival this year, which, you know, I, I very much enjoyed. And I'm really hoping, really, really excited about next year, hoping that COVID will be over so we can enjoy their their work in person. So we have about seven or eight minutes left, but I don't want to. I don't want to uh, leave this conversation without talking about another component of the arts community and and 
how the arts get supported throughout the state. And, and those are, you know, various um, types of patrons, you know, mm -hmm. ticket holding, uh, ticket owning uh, consumers, uh, as well as donors, individuals, corporations, um, you know, the state of, of Maryland, Howard County itself, you know, and everybody's getting a big squeeze and everybody's Absolutely. getting a big revenue hit. Um, so, you know, what's been the experience so far? What's the outlook and, and what are you bracing for? Um, so, a great question. So let's start with the state. So Maryland State Arts Council organizations uh, of all sizes and uh, also in certain cases artists. So uh, MSAC has uh, generally been fairly well funded within this gubernatorial administration. It, it is pretty clear that the governor, you know, respects and supports the arts and, and for that we're all very grateful. Uh, obviously, we were hoping that the fiscal 21 budget would stay at the fiscal 21 budget levels. Mm -hmm. That's not feasible, um, but the Board of Public Works today stated that as of right now, the um, the funding will remain at FY 2020 levels. I'm not sure how that's going to affect new organizations who mm -hmm. have not gotten Maryland State Arts Council grants in prior years uh, since you know the pot sort of um, staying the same and there are, there are more participants. We are obviously, we, we are in Maryland State Arts Council grantee. They're phenomenal to work with. We are waiting to find out what you know our grant amount will be for this fiscal year. We typically would have, would have known by this time in July. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually very positive for us that we know that that money will exist and isn't going away. Um, I think one of the biggest concerns from a, an organizational perspective with grant makers is that grant makers typically have very clear requirements for their grants. For the trust, for example, not only do we apply for grants, both state grants, um, Columbia Association grants, um, uh, corporate grants, we also apply for direct sponsorship and typically sponsorship is for a specific event or a specific program. Mm -hmm. And if that program doesn't happen, the sponsorship goes away. The grants tend to be a little bit more flexible. Still, those grants expect certain things to happen. I know a lot of organizations are concerned first about whether their operating grants will go away for a lack of, um, not just lack of funding, but lack of being able to hold these events and these performances. And then second, when we go into the next fiscal year, everyone's budgets have come substantially down as everyone is, is saving money as much as possible during the pandemic. Uh, typically those grants are determined based on prior fiscal years. So mm -hmm. as we look for the next, next fiscal year, thing, not seeing this reduction continue through for multiple future years. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are definitely some opportunities out there. I think it's been really great to see some of the grant makers um, focusing on these resiliency uh, grants and trying to make sure that operating expenses are paid. Nobody ever wants to pay operating expenses. Everyone wants to pay for uh, a program. They wanna pay for an event. They wanna pay for a performance. They wanna pay for a statue. They wanna pay for some you know, tangible, uh, tangible um, mm -hmm. good uh, mm -hmm. or tangible programmatic piece, but you got to keep the lights on. And it's not very exciting, but you have to make sure that the property is insured. You have to make sure the organization is insured. You have to make sure that all of this overhead compliance happens and all of that costs money. Right. And, and it also gets back to, to one of the more, you know, philosophical conversations about, about the, the role of government versus the private sector versus individuals in terms of, of supporting the arts. I mean, to your point about the state of Maryland, I, I think it can also be said for Howard County that there is certainly a commitment 
that the arts are a vital function of society and that and that government is going to support it um you know but at the same time i guess my sense is is that um you know everybody has to be prudent with the money that they have and that the dollar pie is not going to get any bigger um so it's going to be a challenge for everybody i think it's definitely going to be a challenge um i think that the pandemic is going to at some point end and there will be from this new ways to consume art and new ways to engage audiences. One of the most exciting things that I've seen is just the sheer volume of arts organizations that have taken to virtual media and have really engaged their audiences in new and creative ways. So, um, you know, I talked about the film festival, the, you know, um, Columbia F Festival of the Arts put out this amazing Columbia Film Festival that was all virtual this year. And, you know, I think that um, obviously I very much like to get together with people in real life. I don't really love Zoom or, or any sort of virtual media. But I do think that, you know, we're going to come out of this and, you know, it's great to see something on the other side of the world that, but for the pandemic would have never been available online. Right. Does, do you think it will, and, and this is my next to last question, mm -hmm. but do you think, cause, cause I participated in some cool things online, like virtual comedy clubs, you know, where like you go listen to comedians and, you know, you pay what you want to pay and all that. Um, and, and yeah, there have been, you know, from, you know, Pink Floyd concerts to, you know, very small scale events where people, you know, do what they will. Do you think that that's a, that's a scalable thing? I mean, do you think that it could be a, you know, there could be a thing one day where it's something that's produced locally and it's please come uh, and tickets are this much or join us online and pay whatever. So I think that even before the pandemic, we've seen more and more engagement that takes place both in I don't want to say real life because I guess this has become our new real life, but takes right. place physically and then also takes place virtually. Uh, events that are Facebook Live. We've seen lots of great active engagement on Instagram, on Facebook Live, even on YouTube uh, when arts organizations do things in real time. There are tons of, of intellectual property issues with how that's done, but you know, it, for all intents and purposes, um, when those are, are sort of met, having a performance that you can engage with in a different way, but also to be able to share that experience with people who maybe missed that event or maybe um, might want to come to a new event. So I think that that was starting, I think it, it, it ramp, ramped up exponentially during uh, this quarantine time uh, where people are being kept socially distanced and apart. I do think that will continue. I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but I do think that will continue. I, I hear from so many of my friends, wow, I wish I had gotten together and spent this much time talking to far-flung family members or um, friends from college I haven't seen in years. And now we're talking more often because I have the time and because, you know, if you're in, you know, 500 miles apart, it doesn't really matter as much if you're, you're meeting on Zoom. Um, I think we're seeing lots of people uh, tuning in and finding art in other parts of the world that maybe they knew existed and they were interested in, but they didn't really have a good way of engaging in it. Uh, I know a lot of people have used this time to explore different interests and different parts of art uh, that they maybe didn't realize that they liked. Um, but it's sort of come up and the investment of time was pretty low. And, you know, I've, I've heard from so many people who have, 
you know, seen pieces that the Met has put out um, uh, of their, their previously recorded operas who would maybe never purchase a ticket there that find that this is really exciting and I want to see more of it. Yeah, it, it, it's, I mean, of, of course we're in a incredibly uh, unsettling and disturbing and, and disrupting time, but, but it's, it'll be interesting to see the opportunities for both the production and consumption of art that, that come down the path in the future. Nina, is there anything that you want to promote at this time? This is that, that time of the podcast when people get to promote their stuff. Well, I always love promoting things. So we will be putting mm -hmm. out um, a little later a, uh, a list of our virtual events and our, um, our, hopefully we will also, after we put out these virtual events, be able to share with you our September and October events. We're still waiting and working with the health department uh, to make sure that we can do that. But I would absolutely encourage people to keep an eye on our Facebook page, our Instagram page, and our website, um, because those will be updated shortly. And we are hoping to continue to engage the local community in some really cool things as we look and see what 2021 brings. Awesome. And, and the Facebook page and address are? Uh, so the Facebook page is Meriwether Park at Symphony Woods. And uh, the Instagram page is the same. Our website is innerarbortrust.org. And that's Arbor with an A. That's right. Nina, thank you for coming on the podcast again. This is actually your second appearance. Apparently. For, thank for you. It's just the, uh, it's a little <laughs> odd not doing it at the chrysalis. You know, yeah, there was part of me that thought of it, but then we would have had to have done the distance thing, and then it would have been, I don't know. So Maybe. I will say it is also raining a bit outside today. So this yeah, is probably it did just start hour. the thunderstorm. So oh. thank you again, Nina, you. for being on, and thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Um, on Thursday, Jason should be back, and we are going to be interviewing uh, independent candidate for Congress in District 7. Um, Amber Ivy. So until then, uh, I'm Bill Woodcock. You've been listening or watching Forward Maryland. Take care, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>